Today you will hear again from Dr. Mukesh Jaiswal, who is one of the application scientist, works in the areas of next generation sequencing technologies. He will talk to you about whole exome sequencing kit for investigating rare diseases. This is probably going to be the last lecture on the NGS technology and its application. And while today's lecture is not going to cover much of the basics of NGS, but is definitely going to give you more information about possible applications from these platforms. So, let us continue on this lecture today and then we will try to conclude what we have learnt out of this NGS based platform from basics to the applications. Okay. So, today uh, uh, we are going to talk about the investigating the rare disease and its treatment with the Agilent solutions. So, it is, uh, so I am going to cover about uh, what are the rare disease and how uh, uh, basically it can be diagnosed by the NG solution and how we can basically uh, give the treatment to the patient. Right? So, we have some solutions where basically, basically you use uh, Agilent solution for the diagnostic of rare disease and, and its, its treatment part. So, it is going to cover uh, some uh, background of rare disease and then uh, I am going to talk about some, some part of CRISPR-Cas, how, how basically it can utilize for, for the treatment purpose. So, what are the rare disease? Uh, rare disease basically uh, is, 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 is a rare disease, it is affected 60 million people in US and Europe. So, it is a big number, it is quite a big number. And 7000 uh, rare disease basically known in uh, till now and 80% uh, reason of that is, is genetics, is something wrong in, uh, wrong in their genetics. So, yes please. We are talking about 60 million affected in the US and Europe. Yeah. Is there any study for me? Yeah, I am coming to the next slide. So, I am coming to the next slide. So, this is like some word wide I am telling. So, now I am going to the next slide we have, I have Indian data also. And 50% uh, uh, affected uh, children are basically affected with this disease. So, so coming to Indian scenario, uh, yeah. So, ICMR, the Indian Medical Council of Research launched this registry 2017. And they said that uh, around 70 million people in India is also suffering for this rare disease. So, it is a quite big number and that is why they launch a project uh, ICMR registry where you can basically write a grant to them to work on the rare disease, what is the problem, how, how you can diagnose that thing, what is the treatment part of that. So, in 2007, April 2017, they, they launched this project and uh, so these are the key objectives of uh, this ICMR registry. So, its main, main objective is that to understand what is the problem of rare disease, what is the causation of that and, and how it can be, how this data can be utilized for the treatment of the rare disease. So, these are two uh, main objective of the ICMR and uh, uh, so, uh, it launched and I think it is available for the grant application also. Okay, so I'm going to talk about some of the rare disease which is existing worldwide. is is worldwide. So let's come in the first uh, cystic fibrosis. This one. So this is the this is a disease basically uh, where the excessive mucus is deposit on uh, uh, lung or pancreas, which cause the respiratory failure and inability in the digestion part. And the median survival rate for this disease is 40 years. Right, and uh, the worldwide is a uh, seven seventy thousand patients are known worldwide. Then leukodystrophy, this one, and this is again the progressive disease affect the brain, spinal cord, and the nervous system. And uh, this this is basically children basically affected or with this disease, and uh, five to ten years basically children, and around sixty thousand. Uh, Children are affected worldwide. Retinopigmentosa, this is another disease, and uh, it is it is affected. Uh, it causes the blindness, 
and uh, it, it basically the survival is, is like 40 year and around uh, 100,000 of 15 million, 1.5 million worldwide patients are known for this disease. So, so what's the cause of this? What's the cause of this? The cause of this basically, uh, sometime it is affected by the single gene or sometime it's affected by the multiple gene, right? So if it is uh, like the first one, cystic fibrosis, is only the one gene that is CFTR. There are several mutations on CFTR. And then this uh, transporter, transmembrane transporter is basically disturbed and that caused the cystic fibrosis. So in this cystic fibrosis, only one gene got affected, right? But if you see this, these two, the multiple genes are affected. So it's very difficult to uh, identify when the multiple genes are affected. So here, like 30 genes are affected here, and in, uh, uh, in this disease, it's 77, right? So problem is that uh, this caused the damaged neuron, and here in the uh, uh, retinitis pigmentosa, it is cone cell and the root cells are basically disturbed, right? So these are the disease and the, their multiple uh, genes are basically involved in there. Some more, which is uh, included in the ICMR project basically. So this is, uh, this is childhood ovarian cancer, uh, ovarian, ovarian cell carcinoma, endometriosis, and there are multiple genes basically involved in this, uh, this, this disease also. So this is also uh, incorporated in a ICMR registry. You can go in their website, you can basically look uh, what are the rare diseases. The challenge is that, is, is their diagnostic? How to diagnose this disease, right? So if you go the regular process of uh, diagnosis of this one, this one is pretty expensive and doctor basically takes uh, at least eight years to diagnose and they go like 40 different methods to diagnose this test. So because the, the complexity of disease is not like one gene, it's like multiple genes they are affected, right? And, and they, basically they, they take at least seven years and 40 minutes to use for the <coughs> diagnosis. So that's a challenge. It, it is pretty expensive, it takes time. But for the treatment purpose, if you have early intervention of this disease, you know the cause of early, very early, then the very early diagnosis, then you can, you can do early intervention and then improve the quality of the life. So that is, this is a challenge, but if, if it take a lot of, like eight years to diagnose only, it would be difficult, right? So, in, so that's why, the, uh, that's why uh, it is very important to diagnose the disease in very early stages. So right now, if it is, if you see this uh, rare disease, now uh, 2012 when the exam panel just started, it was only 130 gene. Now uh, 2017 is more than uh, 200k mutations are known for or the rare disease. Basically, uh, this is because of the more advancement of the exam panels. So is is you need to extract the DNA from the patient. Right, and then go for library preparation, library preparation, and then uh, target enrichment. After seeing the library is basically perfectly fine, you can sequence and go for data analysis. So this kind of one workflow, uh, basically you can use our exam panel for the diagnosis of the rare disease. So the challenges is always there, uh, but I would talk about uh, why why the Agilent exome panel is more uh, uh, better actually in sense because we make uh, RNA baits and this, it is oligo baits basically and uh, these are these are because we make the RNA bait they they have the better RNA DNA hybridization and these are the high fidelity bases which we make by the inject technology we make this this bait by the oligo so this is our high fidelity basis. If you see the error rate in the base, in, in the pros basically is very low in Agilent. It's like one or two uh, error basically in one KB. For others have lots of, uh, so, so we, have, we have the high fidelity pros basically which are bi 
it is used for the making the libraries. So this is the different ways uh, you can make the exam libraries. So starting material will always be the genomic DNA, right? We have three different ways to make the libraries for the exam sequencing. One is XT, XT2, and QST. XT is basically uh, is this one. If you have a, a different patients, eight patients, right? You can make an individual library from each patient's independent capture, and you can pull while while sequencing, right? When you go for sequencing, you can pull this sample and go for one sequencing run. So that's the XT preparation of the uh, exome preparation. Another, if you want to do the, some comparative study, you can barcode the patient sample and pool itself, A to 16. In one pool, you can follow by the capture and go for sequencing. So it, you can compare between the patients also, that is XT2. And another, another is live preparation is based on enzymatic sharing. So you can use transposis enzyme for the, to make the libraries basically. Transposis enzyme, then hybridization, followed by the sequencing. This is the fastest way you can make the libraries for the exome sequencing. Okay, so performance for all these methods to make the exome library are, is pretty good and they get, they get very good coverage, more than 95% uh, coverage all the methods. This is the three pillars basically Agilent works on uh, basically uh, performance of the exam library, contents and the flexibility. We work from decades to improve the performance, content and the flexibility of the kids basically. So if we see more of, most of the rare disease basically now studied by this panel, which is called a clinical research exam panel. And this exam panel contains the, all the exon reason and also the, the panels on the intronic part of the region, which is basically associated with the inherited disorder. We have the latest uh, uh, exome panel V7. This is mentioned V6, uh, but we have now V7, and that basically covers all the translational and the clinical research panel. It covers whole exome. Another, we have the very small panel of the focus exome basically is covered the disease sensitization. But most of the most of the rare disease basically which I talked before, it is basically uh, used for the clinical research panel. So if you see the contents performance of this one, with, with this uh, clinical research exome panel, they, they have like uh, 5,000 gene is basically deeply covered uh, with the disease associated region with the clinical exome. And the challenge is that when you, when, you, when you go for the diagnosis of rare disease, the most of the mutations are present in the GC region. <coughs> to make the library for the GC region is always a challenge. So, but in, with our uh, clinical exam panel, the performance in the GC region is very good. It's very uniform preparation of the library when you go for the GC preparation. So content basically, uh, what's the content on the on, for for the for for the for the probes basically? It is basically uh, uh, designed by the Dr. Madhuri Hegde from Emory University, and they make the basically uh, the probes which is covered all the disease association, exon and intronic part, which covers maximum uh, rare disease parts. For example. This is the uh, leukodystrophy, right? And the, this pathogenic variant, that is uh, G, uh, G, uh, G, uh, JC2, this gene, basically, if you see, compare, because this is the GC rich region, and if you just compare with the other vendor, you don't see any coverage. There's no, no coverage for this gene. And if you see the clinical exam panel, we covered this part also to be able to detect the five prime UTR variants with this disease. So in this disease, this is the kind of pathogenic variant and you can easily detect by the clinical exam panel. Another, retinitis pigmentosa. If you see two other vendors, this uh, CFD1 gene is not covered in this part because this is the intronic part, the exonic part. Intronic part are not covered. 
right? But if you see our one is is fairly covered that part. That means is detection of that mutation is is very easy on that. Then if you see this region, again is well covered by this. Uh, this not this is these are all non-coding region. These are well covered with the with our clinical assessment exam. And most of the pathogenic variant basically in for rare disease is present on non-coding region. So it is 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 fairly covered with the clinical assessment exam panel. So if you see overall in uh, in the clinical assess panel, we cover all the clean variants, pathogenic reasons, and uh, it covers mostly like 98% regions are covered. And others basically has low coverage. So if you think about when you when when the doctor is going to diagnose this leukodystrophy, it takes eight years, right? By the normal method. And the average test basically they do around 20, 30 tests to, to do to diagnose for this one. It takes eight years, right? And the cost is, is goes up like it's like twenty thousand uh, dollar, right? But when you do one simple test, uh, our clinical exam panel you easily identify this mutation, and that is basically for the leukodystrophy. And it is very cost effective, right? And it So it is it's just going to cost like uh, like fifteen thousand rupees, right? So one test costs like fifteen thousand rupees for exam panel. Yeah, because it covers uh, the intronic part, exam part. Definitely, it going to detect that thing, but but detection rate is faster, right? And it takes less time. So doctors start their intervention much earlier. With that, like suppose uh, this is our content, and we but we doesn't make this content in vacuum. We 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 do the research and we make we make the probes for cover all those reasons, right? But sometime uh, when you did some your experiment, right, and and some part basically you think that this is the part maybe pathogenic part, and it is missing, right? And and you want to incorporate that part in your panel so it is very flexible we can customize the panel according to your requirement also suppose any any gene and it is not uh, basic the intronic part is not covered and if you want uh, interested i want to cover this part also we can basically add this panel and incorporate in your panel so that's our flexibility so we work on three parts performance and the contents always optimize year by year and then flexibility if you want to add more right so it's very simple workflow that I, I told it start from the library preparation, then we make the targeted panel by the probes, right? And then uh, data analysis and reporting. <coughs> Whole workflow basically takes three to four days and, uh, and it's easy to identify the kind of challenges for a diagnosis of rare disease, right? So now this part is kind of over. Like uh, if you if you if you get uh, some kind of mutations, right, in in any disease, not only in rare disease, of course, cancer, right, and uh, but it's, it, it is multiple mutation, and you want to solve this problem for the treatment purpose. So we have a tools called as the CRISPR Cas, where basically you can do do the gene editing, right, and to 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 uh, Solve to fix that gene for the for the for the treatment purpose. But, yeah, but this is very early. We launched some libraries for the treatment, but it's very early stage. Let's start with that. What is the CRISPR Cas? This allow you basically to allow the mutation to correct maybe or gene editing. So it is based on the guide RNA, right? So this is the guide RNA. This one. And this is the site of recognition, and this is the Cas9 enzyme. When this become active, they attach, and it goes to the PAM site like this. If it is identical or hybridized on that, like this, it is identical with that, it creates a NIC. 
right? This cache name enzyme, when this guide iron is specific to that, it creates a nick. Now it allows you three possibilities. One possibility is that just leave like this and body repair, body system, our, our cell system basically go for non homologous joining and cause the knockout of that gene, right? It creates a knockout. Second is the homologous recombination. If, if we want to do the gene editing and use some half homologous sequence, you can incorporate this homologous sequence in that, right? Third part, this is the deactivated Cas9 enzyme. This yellow color part, it might be activator or deactivator. Depending upon the activator, it can induce the gene expression or reduce the gene expression. So it allows the whatever mutations basically you got from the exome panel, right? You can basically try to correct or you can do the gene editing for the treatment purpose. So that's whole story, exome panel and What's, what's their follow up? So we are working on the functional genomics where basically we can uh, try to edit these genes in a large scale like, and uh, it, it might be any knockdown, knockout and knock in, anything and try to edit their genes to solve the problems. So this is the, if you study the functional genomics, so very first prospect is knockout, right? If it is knockout, means guide RNA breaks that one, it makes the truncated protein, right? So your protein not going to work, it's truncated protein. Knock-in means uh, it's basically going to add some tag on that, on the protein. Turn-off means if it is a high expression, this is the, in, this is the repressor fusion, if it is, uh, Turn off means the lower expression of the gene. This is the genomic mutasis, mutagenesis. Here basically it's a site specific mutation you can create by the CRISPR-Cas. Suppose you got some mutation and you want to solve that mutation, right? You can change a base by base by the mutagenesis, right? So this way you can correct that SNPs you got, right? You can correct that part. So this allows you to site specific changes with the Cas9 and if you want to do some, some genes are basically low, lowly expressed in sub disease, you can basically induce the expression to the higher level, right? So it can induce the gene expression. So you can do multiple function by the Cas9, you can induce the gene, you can, you can repress the gene expression or you can do the side specific changes in the gene, right? Let's allow you five different possibilities to do. So uh, now the question is that, suppose you like in cystic fibrosis, right? You work on single gene and there may be one or two mutations you got with the exome panel, right? And you want to fix that problem, right? So there's two ways. One way means if one gene and few mutations, so basically you're going to use four to five different guide RNAs, not more than that. So for that one, you can make the guide RNAs in your lab. So suppose uh, this is this is the target basically. You're going to uh, you're going to make a guide RNA for that one only. So this is the target panel target target you want. Just add the T7 promoter on that, right? If you add the T7 promoter on that and go for uh, so. The kids basically what they have, they have a T7 primers and go for in vitro transcription to make a, a guide RNA. For in vitro transcription, you make a guide RNA which is the reverse complementary to the target, which is going to be reverse complementary to the target. So this is the kind of guide RNA. This is, this is the red part basically is very specific to the target you away to the part where you're interested for and this is the backbones minimum backbone and this when this going to bind on the target gene this this targeted part in the presence of cast engine this gene basically cleaved into part if you verify this one if in the presence of cast 9 this gene basically cleave off right 
So this allows three, two, three, five different possibility again. Basically, going to maximum time is going to knock out the gene, right? <coughs> so if it is your genes in, in, in numbers as one, one or two gene, and you want to use that, you can make a guide in your lab also, right? But mostly, it's not a case. It's not a case. There are multiple, multiple genes are going to, is involved for the for any complex genetic, genetic right? Like retinal pigmentosa, 77 genes is involved. And mutations, it's like more than 1,000 mutations are basically involved there, right? So what we do, we make a guide RNA for that, for that panel, right? And this is totally custom, custom thing, is we don't make, we still make some catalog, but we still totally depend on the users. So we make a guide RNA on a slide. We uh, cleave that one from the slide, do the PCR amplification, and pack on the viral particle. Now it's ready to transfect in the cell system. That much guide RNA basically, which is for that mutation, right? It's going to ready for transfection, and you can use for the therapeutic opportunity for this. Right. So this is the this is. That, uh, so the target cells are actually. Yeah, cell culture. And then? So it's, 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 it's a viral particle. These are, these are cells basically to transfect directly into there. Cells are then? Transfect with this guide RNA. They already have a Cas9 enzyme. So it create the, means the Cas9 is there, right? So it's going to cleave that part of the gene. Or it depends on what, what you design basically. So those cells would be Yeah. Then So see, I, I told you this is in very, this is very early stage. Again, to do this thing, you need to do lots of screening, lots of NGS work to identify it's going to work or not. So this is just, just a thought and guide RNA is, 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 we can synthesize for you, but again, the protocols and how you're going to translate to the actually patient is very, is in very early stage. It is like 10, 20 gene you can make in your lab but if it is more than 1,000 gene in high scale, then we can make. I uh, mean, it's, it's for the high scale, not, not, otherwise you can just make in a lab. Just, just, uh, your, your, any target at T7. Hmm. These are specific targets. Yes, specific target. Just add the T7 promoter on that. Use T7 primer and do in vitro transcription. That's inside the guide RNA. So it's very straightforward protocol, but yeah, again, you cannot make the thousand guide RNA for multiple gene, right? In that approach, you can use this, this guide RNA strat uh, strategy and try to solve the problems. But yeah, I, I would tell you this is, this is not easy. It's very, very hard, right? It's, it's very hard because if you see this, this is going to be uh, like thousands of the guide RNA and going to transfer in the cells, right? Now you're going to go give some uh, uh, treatment by drugs, right? And then you need to go for screening protocols day by day. And again, you're going to verify this, this thing going to be work by the validate or not by the NGS. But of course, this is the thought. And you can basically try to solve that problems. So in that con contest, <coughs> Agilent is happy to collaborate with the people who are interested for to make a guide RNAs, right? And we already had some, some guide RNAs of different disease. Like if you have the cancer panels, we already have the, these are the genes and these are the guide RNA we make, already have some. And there are multiple, multiple panels like mitochondria, gene expression, protein membrane. These are the panels we already made, we already catalog back panel. You can use that one, but uh, again, the how it's going to work and how it's going to screen, it is a little diffi difficult task. <coughs> so in summary, means uh, you can use the NGS application to identify the causation, what's the cause of that. And, and I give the little brief idea how the CRISPR-Cas can be best solution for the drug validation and personal genomics. So, this is 
This is something uh, you can use the NGIS application to identify the problems and CRISPR can might be used for, for the treatment part. Right? So now I'm covering a five, five, five slide from the IVF uh, segment. So in reproductive medicine, the most challenging part in the IVF is that uh, aneuploidy in the embryos. Whenever couples go for the IVF and they do the in vitro fertilization, and 70% are the embryos are basically aneuploidy, right? And uh, so what doctor do? At least in India, what doctor do? They they look the good looking embryos, identify it, and basically uh, implant like three to four embryo, sometimes two, sometimes three, depends. So the challenge is that when doctor do this thing, if the good looking image and probably not going to implant, so your IV cycles fail. If it is two embryos are good, so both going to implant, it's going to give twins. If it is three good embryo, it's going to go three kids, right? So it's a challenge. You get either one, two, or three. There's no, there's no control on that, right? So we are discussing with the IVF clinic and working on a single embryo transfer paradigm. Means check the embryos. They are good enough. They are euploidy embryo, not aneuploidy. And only one single euploidy embryo is basically uh, go for the further IVF cycle and for the implantation. So we are discussing this thing with single embryo transplant. Doctors basically do, they do the blastocyst culture and they don't do, uh, they do the biopsy and frozen on the embryo, but they skip this part, PGS, pre-implantation genetic in India. And after what if, uh, frozen, this embryo taken and go for the IVF. So they use three to four embryos and directly implant. What we are talking to doctor, do the PGS, identify the good embryos, once good embryo, and implant, process for the implantation. So you, the, doc, the couples get, get going to get only one kid, right? So when, when we talk about the problems, if, they, they, if the pregnancy goes with the two, uh, two twins, there's a lots of problem with the preterm labor, preeclampsia, and it's high rate of the prenatal death in the twins, right? So that's why we talk, talk to doctor, go for this test, <coughs> means you can go for frozen, with that do the PGS. PGS means you just go for the screening of all 24 chromosome, identify all the chromosomes are good enough, identify the euploidy embryo, and then go for the IVF. So how basically they do? By transferring the one embryo, basically it also is cost effective for the couples also. It's, it's five times less pain basically to grow the kids, right? So how they do? This test is basically done by the biopsy of the embryo. So this is the embryo. And this is the, this is the blastocyst and they take the one cell of the embryo, only one cell of the embryo. So this is one cell they collected. So when this biopsy is done, one cell is collected from the IVF uh, embryologist. And for that, because one cell has a very low amount of DNA, you cannot do anything with that. So we, we, do, we do the whole genome amplification to increase the quantity of DNA, right? And we label with this DNA with the, with the Psi 3 and Psi 5 dive, right? And hybridize on a micro slide and go for the analysis, right? If there is some mutations, this is the mutations. If some mutation on the chromosome number 3 or chromosome 20, 22, or deletion at chromosome number 21, it shows that these embryos are aneuploidy and do not process for the, for the IVF, right? So you can identify this by adding the PGS test. You can basically identify the aneuploidy uh, in eight hours and 
and after do this, basically the success rate of the IVF basically increase. When they don't do any test, the success rate going to be 80% with this single embryo transfer paradigm, right? Because he identified the, all the chromosome, where's the, where's the problem? If it's a deletion, don't process for the IVF. So this is the smart ART, right? It j before to doing uh, impl process for the aneuploidy, just do the PGS, validate this embryo or good enough, and then go for the IVF side, right? Thank you. All right, so I'm sure after listening to today's application based lecture, you must have found this very interesting. And you saw that how the whole exome sequencing kit can be used for diagnosis of rare diseases and how the results can be used to choose the right treatment. I'm sure this is just one of the success stories of many things which can be done on various type of NGS based platforms. Dr. Jaiswal also briefly gave you an idea about CRISPR-Cas technology, which is one of the much talked about gene editing technologies available. And I hope you have enjoyed not only today's lecture, but also the series of lectures which we had in the last couple of days and week about NGS technology platforms. And this is one of the revolutionary technology which is really transforming the way we have seen the medicine and clinics are really you know getting revolutionized with much faster pace of assays coming to the clinics for the patient care. So your understanding and your knowledge about these applications and these novel technology platforms are definitely going to be very useful and I must say there is a wealth of data available now from various type of genome sequencing projects. If you know what you are looking for, you can do a lot of uh, data analysis from yourself. I will give you one instance, one example. The Cancer Genome Atlas TCGA is one of the good resources for looking at the you know patient's cancer data available. And while they published that work a couple of years ago in Science uh, and Nature series of papers published. But what is more important when they made data publicly available for thousands of patients genome data, then the metadata analysis from that data many people have looked at very specific type of questions. What is the impact of given genes in patient survival for example? or looking at a specific pathways. And you know maybe hundreds of papers are actually published just by looking at data alone, not by generating data, right. So what, what I want to convey you is that you need not to generate the patient derived genome sequence data just for the sake of looking at everything biologically. You if you are interested, you can just go download these data, use many of the publicly available software and resources, analyze in your own manner. And then probably you can get some very meaningful and new information even possible just by looking at these data for addressing certain questions. So I hope some of these exposures what we are trying to provide you is going to really make you more comfortable and also make you more enthusiastic and motivated to really take lead forward. Well, I will I'll thank you to stop today's lecture, but we will have more exciting things to continue uh, in the next lectures as well when we talk about a new resource for you which is human protein atlas. Thank you.